yeah, teacher to teacher. Sounds like this. Yes. So you'll see them there when he's following and he goes through all those things. Yeah. Yeah. Call to order the September 13th, 2023 agenda setting meeting for the Willow Hill School District. Miss, please call the roll. <laughs> Missy Harns. Harns. <laughs> yeah, I, Harns. Mrs. Arthrell. Here. Mr. Belmont. Here. Miss Lawson. Mr. Clanagan Bay. Here. Dr. McMillan. Mr. Renslin. Here. Miss Creech. Miss Reed. Here. Mr. Scott. Here. Please stand for the flag. Sorry, Miss Lawson's here. My bad. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, and indivisible, whatever it's being conducted for. Okay. One four, we will be asking for accept, uh, acceptance of the August agenda uh, setting meeting minutes. One five, we will be um, asking for acceptance of the um, August legislative meeting minutes. One six, prior to this meeting, the board met an executive. Um, there we discussed uh, student enrollment and uh, staffing. Do we have any announcements? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. President, tonight we have three announcements. First, um, the project at the Rankin Community Center will be hosting a grand opening on Thursday, October 12th at 6 o'clock p.m. We want to invite our entire community to attend that. We have an exciting evening planned, and that's where we'll be formally introducing everyone to the programs we'll be offering um, at the Rankin Center. I have to thank Mr. Bridge, Mr. Johnson for all their work. Um, we were very uh, inexpensively able to get into that building because they took the word on inside. Biggest expense we had was the paving of the lot. Um, and as you could see, that's something we we're going to be able to extend to the community to use for their activities that they have. So we're excited about the Ranking Community Center. Quick turnaround time for us to be able to get that out. So Thursday, October 12th. Second, we'll be hosting an international food festival with an ambassador visit on collaboration with um, the folks from University of Pittsburgh. Thursday, September 21st, there's a flyers information going out about that. We will send additional information Friday and next week. Starts at 4.30 p.m. at the high school. It's going to end around 7.30. Uh, we're going to culminate with two performances in our auditorium. There's going to be an African dance, a still drum, and the Tamboritsons from the University of Duquesne are going to put a final performance on. So really going to be something neat to see, and we're always proud to show off our auditorium. Our last announcement, the board met in executive session tonight and took a hard look at our numbers. Obviously, you only make projections when you uh, try to pass a budget in the spring by the end of June about what your enrollment is going to be in the upcoming school year. And we are proud to say for the first time that uh, we have an enrollment increase in the district. So we are up about 50 students from where we were last year at this date. So we are very proud of that. We believe that, you know, our marketing and our strategies are working and the improvement to some of our curriculum initiatives are working to recruit students, especially in our elementary schools. So with that, um, I'm happy to announce, and I know the teachers are going to be relieved to hear this, that we will be adding a third grade at Turtle Creek, a fifth grade at Turtle Creek, and a fifth grade at Edgewood. So that's going to allow us to recall our last two furloughed elementary teachers. It's going to allow us to decrease our class size in those two fifth grade classes and that 113 to around 18, 19 per grade level. So it is gonna be a small disruption. The students are already in that room, so they're gonna be split up, uh, but overall it's gonna make a uh, better learning environment for all. So thank you to the board for your willingness to do that. And um, congratulations to the principals, because I know you were fighting for that. And that concludes our announcements. So it looks like um, we are welcoming a student representative, Bree Boyd. 
Hi, I'm Bree Boyd. I'm a senior at the high school. Um, this, like so far this month, we have homecoming next week. Um, we have spirit week all until homecoming dance. So Monday is PJ day, Tuesday, dynamic duo. Wednesdays, like show off like your biker versus surfer stuff. Um, Thursday, um, that actually is biker versus surfer. I guess Wednesday it was left out. Friday is battle of the classes. But um, we're also putting class floats that the teachers will be voting on. So that'll be 9th through 12th, just competing with their floats. Um, the pep rally will be Friday, and that is our coronation for king and queen. Um, the parade will be later that day at 545 at Keystone Commons. And then the homecoming game kickoff is at 7 p.m. And then at halftime, the court will be introduced. Just a PSA. I am on court, so make sure all your kids vote me, Hoko Queen. <laughs> um, Shame and, plug. <laughs> I mean... I'm going to use what I got. <laughs> and then the homecoming dance will be the 23rd from 5 to 9. And then like, like Dr. C said, the International Festival will be the 21st from 4.30 to 7.30. FBLA is hosting a trip to Kalahari in the Pocono Mountains for a state leadership workshop. Registry the registration deadline is September 29th. That is a very fun trip, so I recommend anyone to sign up. Um, the junior class is planning a powder puff game. The date is to be determined. Um, the soccer teams are both doing very well. The golf teams are improving. We have a girls team now that a lot of my friends are on. Um, the tennis team is growing and becoming more competitive. Cross country, Annabelle Johnson finished first a few weeks ago in the Boston River Trail Race and seventh in the Red, White, and Blue Invitational. The football team is looking forward to a bounce back game at North Hills. Volleyball is looking forward to a big match up against Plum. The performing arts show is Clue and that will be in December. I'll be in that too, if you wanna see that. Um, and the junior high musical is Annie in January. And then the overall atmosphere of the building seems to be more positive and much more calm this year. And that's all I have for today. Thank you for that presentation. So we have a couple presentations. Um, we'll start with Kelly Patterson from Nutrition Inc. The back to school update. Good evening. And that's a tough act to follow. I don't know if I want to be next. Um, as you had already said, my name is Kelly Patterson. I'm the regional manager with the Nutrition Group, um, and I've worked with the Woodland Hill School District for quite a number of years now, very happily and proudly. So I just wanted to bring a quick presentation, I promise I'll talk fast, um, to tell you what we're doing in the 23-24 school year, because we've got some exciting stuff happening. Um, for the audience, if you have not sampled yet, there are some samples in the back of some new products that we brought in for the students. Um, there is a plant-based taco meat back there, which tastes exactly like taco meat, it's pretty amazing. Um, there are some uh, dumplings back there and a queso of sauce back there that are all new this year for the students. So please feel free to have those samples. Thank you. Um, so just uh, bringing into you what we focus on, you know, we focus on the cost controls, we focus on new products, we focus on nutrition education, events for your students. It's so much more than just planning the lunch menu, and you'll see some of those things. If you follow our director, Kyleen, who I'm sure you are all very familiar with because she is everywhere. It's like there's four of her. Um, if you follow her on social media, you'll see all of the amazing things that are happening in those cafeterias. This year's theme um, was positivity when we had our summer seminar for our directors this year, when we get them all together um, in various locations across seven states, the theme was positivity. So we're focusing on that with our directors as well as our hourly staff. Professional Development Day, we hold a training day for your staff each year that helps them meet the requirements that are set forth by PDE. They have to earn so many training requirements each year, um, hours based on the number of hours they work in a day. So we hold a professional development day for them where they attend and receive that training and meet those necessary hours. We also focused on positivity with them. Some of the topics that we cover, civil rights training, offer versus serve, HACCP, which are safety rules, cost control, um, chef's corner, new products. So they learn a lot that day and it's fun. They get to go out and about. We have some nice breakfast and lunch for them. They win some great door prizes. So it's a day that they enjoy too. Just to look at where we ended last year quickly, um, you can see this first column is the budget and the second column is actual. So happy to say, let's look right across the board, breakfast. We were well over budget for the number of breakfasts served. Um, same with lunch. A la carte was just a little bit behind, which is okay. 
Because overall, um, your profit and loss statement, we were a guaranteed break even this year for not last year, and you actually returned $330,000 to your account. So that's a pretty good number that we were really happy to be able to do for you. Yep. So what's happening right now this year? Like I said, these are just a couple of quick clips from her social media posts. If you follow her, you'll see all the amazing things. Um, featured already this year, we had the vegetarian Tuscan pasta salad. So that was for our vegan students um, and anyone else who enjoyed it. A lot of welcome back and first day things, Oops, sorry. Um, and then featuring the dumplings, you'll see those in the back. So just new items for the students trying to look at what's out there in the, in the market right now. Go ahead. New products. So one of the things that is new this year for us that we have to meet is a reduced sodium standard. They instituted new regulations over the last 10 years that the sodium was going to decrease like every couple of years. We are at a target level now that is very hard to meet um, to the point that it's difficult to serve a grilled cheese sandwich because cheese is very high in sodium. Milk contains sodium. Celery is high in sodium, if you didn't know. Um, so that is one of the reasons why our chefs and purchasers went out into the market last year to work with the vendors for them to reformulate things to bring the sodium content down of the ingredients that we use. The queso that you tried tonight is very low sodium. You would never know. I don't know how they did it, but it's very low sodium and helps us meet those targets, which is a difficult target to meet. Some of the products we brought in, the um, plant protein beef crumbles, which are in the back. We're bringing in the Impossible Burger. That's something that the students are very familiar with. It's a brand they're accustomed to. We will feature those every once in a while on a meatless Monday. And we're happy to bring those things that they're seeing out there in the market into their school cafeterias. Bringing back some of our um, favorite things um, like our around the world menus. We're featuring a featured favorite menu. So it'll be a limited time offering that they'll only have maybe once or twice. <clears throat> so those will be posted in the cafeteria for them to try. We are focusing on our directors and bringing in specialists. So right now we are training directors across the company to be specialists in certain areas. So there will be a team of directors that are specialists in food cost, some that are specialists in helping school get ready for their administrative review, some that are specialists in Primera Wedge, which is what we use to analyze the menus, and then also a culinary team. Those directors will be able to go out into the field and help others continue to learn if there's a specific area that they're struggling in. That's one thing we do really well is teamwork. Um, if I don't know, somebody does, and we don't expect everybody to be experts in everything because there's a massive team behind all of our directors that are happy to help. Nutrition for Life, this is actually happening in your school this week right now. And Kylie, do you want to tell them what you've been working on? Nutrition for Life is um, an event that we do for your youngest students. So for example, your kindergartners, they come in the first time, the cafeteria can be scary. So we pick three days and we really do some fun things for them to make it a little less scary. So what were you guys doing this week? So we actually are having a dinosaur event. And so we had a big menu all week. We brought in dinosaur nuggets. We're having monsters, burger today. And tomorrow we're gonna have a grilled cheese and they're gonna actually imprint a dinosaur into the grilled cheese. And then each day they have a prize for when they participate. It was all the kids. Um, <laughs> And then they have a special treat as well. We also had a new product that we got a sample today, which was a frozen fruit slushie, which counted as a treat, but also a food product. And tomorrow, I'm so happy for this one. They're actually going to have a pre-dessert dirt cup. So it's fun for them, and they got really excited. So that's the awesome things that this girl does. She, like I said, she's everywhere. Um, it, you know, it's just important to us. We know that they're this big. There are so many different things changing for them when they come into kindergarten. And we want the cafeteria to be somewhere that they're comfortable. Their trays are this big. They're this big. Lunch ladies are tall and we can't hear because the cafeteria is loud. So we just try to bring them in and do something really fun for them for three days so that they can, you know, become a partner with us for life. They've got a lot of years left to go through school. So we start when they're little. 
Our programs are coming back. We always feature our noteworthy events, Tasty Bites. Those are um, for the elementary program. They are fun little recipes like a banana split cup, um, caramel apple teddy bears, things that meet a component of the meal, but are also fun and feel a little more less regulated, but they meet all the standards. Wellness Wednesday, we bring in items for the students to sample um, things that they may not try otherwise. And they get that little sticker that says, I tried something new. It has been the same sticker for 10, 15 years. It doesn't matter. They love that sticker. So they'll eat citrus beet salad. They'll try all of these odd things. We tell them they don't have to love it, but we love for them to try it. And then they can take the recipes home to their families. And farm to fork right now, we're pretty heavy into that. Pennsylvania's local growing season coinciding with school is pretty short. So between now and November, we'll be bringing in as much local produce as we can. Nutrition Education Every Day is the program that we feature um, to help add nutrition education into our programs. Instead of trying to get into the classroom and take training time, we do it within the lines. So Kyleen will put together those special programs and try to help uh, instill some great eating habits into your students as well. And Moments Matter, we like to focus on our employees. We know that they go above and beyond often. Um, and every once in a while, a story will stand out in particular where they have gone just really above and beyond to take care of a student or a faculty member or another um, employee, and they get to be nominated. And then multiple times throughout the year, those employees are recognized um, for what they do every day. And newer to our company within the last few years um, is our charity program. So we can do a couple different things. Working with our student workers, we can provide scholarships for their secondary education. And then the, the charity side of the thing is for um, employees and different things. If they have some type of hardship, some type of tragedy that might happen. I know that we've um, locally had this come in and help an employee who experienced a, a fire in their home. So it's just something that we are really passionate about. As a company, we're able to deduct monies right into that charity program so that we can take care of those that, that take care of us all the time. So that's really important to us when we continue to grow that program. So just looking forward to a really great year with you all. And if you have any questions, um, Kyleen is here every day. Our other director, Michelle, is here every day. And they would be happy to answer those. I'm happy to address anything if you have any questions or concerns, but we're just so excited to be here. Questions? Any questions? Thank you. The dumplings were delicious. I had some in the back. They were. So our next presentation is. Um, uh, Mr. Joe Muscatello, Mr. Jeff Mills, there from the Stifle Public Stifle Stifle Stifle. I thought that. Stifle. Stifle. All right, something like that. Stifle Stifle Stifle. Um, public Finance. They are here to discuss with the board our uh, bond issue that um, we discussed a few months ago about um, or for the. Um, project for the HVAC, for the elementary buildings, and for the uh, sports, um, help me. Baseball softball. Thank you. <laughs> Baseball softball, uh, the throwing events for the track team, the tennis courts, um, that whole project up there as well. So gentlemen, come on up. Get your crutches there, Joe. <laughs> yeah. That's my back. Um. I like that dinosaur idea. I might put that in our suggestion box. There you go. <laughs> My name is Joe Muscatello, and I'm with the firm of Steeple Nicholas, and uh, we're here to talk about underwriting your bonds. Uh, before we actually issue bonds, we put together what's called a prospectus. And in that document, it talks about the school district, it summarizes financial statements, talks about the projects, enrollment, assessed value, and the economy. We put that booklet together and we sent it to Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's rates the school district based on the information that we give. And then there's also a call with Jill that uh, is conducted by with S&P. So S&P came back with their rating of the school district and they affirmed the A- minus stable. But they did say what they like and the, the strides that the school district has made in the last few years 
of turning the finances around and having a fund balance of about 10% of your budget. They really liked that fact. Also, that there was an increase in enrollment. They did notice that. So, and Jill did a great job of explaining the project, the finances, where you are now, where you're going to be. So based on all that information, they reaffirmed the A minus. The analyst actually wanted to upgrade the school district based on that information. The committee that he was on wanted more historical information. So if you continue to have the fund balance and do the things that you're currently doing, then the school district would probably be upgraded. And that comes from the analyst and from them. So based on that information, Good. that also has, so your rating has a, a bearing on where the interest rates are. And what I put in front of you is uh, this little uh, package that shows how much the bond issue is going to cost the school district in terms of principal and interest. So the first column or the first box is the existing debt service. So the school district currently has debt service of 7,400,000 and it decreases to about six and a half million dollars and all your debt goes away in 2050. What we do is what's called, um, we, we have one of these issues we do is level debt service and the other one is gonna be a wraparound and I'll explain what that means. So there would be two different bond issues to, for the school district to come up with $15 million in their project fund. We were planning on doing one bond issue of approximately $10 million this year, and then another after the school year, after January 1st. And the reason for doing that is that you can, if you borrow, bonds are like mortgages. Like if you borrow over a certain amount or under a certain amount, you get preferential interest rates. If you go conventional, then you get a better interest rate than if you do a jumbo. Bond issues work the same way, that you get a better interest rate and better call features. As you know, interest rates are a little bit higher than, uh, or higher than they were a lot of year ago. So when we sell these bonds, the, uh, the investors want protected for so much time for if they buy them, they don't want you to recall them right away. So that there's, there's a time limit, there's a five year call. So after five years, the, the school district can refinance those bonds if you issue under $10 million. If you issue over $10 million, then the call feature is 10 years because interest rates are at the levels that they are. And if they go lower, you'd be able to refinance. So these bonds would probably have a 4% coupon on them. And if, they, if the interest rates do fall in the next few years, you'd be able to refinance this. And that's the other reason that we, we have to cross the school year so, or uh, the calendar year. And the bank qualified is based on the calendar year. So the first issue will, will increase the, and I'll go with the highest number, will increase the school district's uh, debt service by $589,000. The next issue would increase it by about 396. So borrowing $15 million would cost the school district about a million dollars a year over what you have. Oh, the other thing I forgot with s &P, the other thing that they liked is that there was, if there was a decrease in taxes, which they thought was great with, you know, after building your fund balance. I didn't want to forget to say that. What is the meaning of debt service? I'm sorry? Debt service. What it means? That's how much you're paying each year to pay back all of your debt. So all the different bond issues that you've had, plus these two, that's your total debt service. The school's district's total debt service would be about 8.8 .8 out until 2026. And then it drops to about seven and a half million dollars. So that includes all principal and interest. So any capital debt the district has ever taken on for building project, remodeling, renovation, et cetera, goes into our debt service payment, which is like a mortgage payment for your house, you know, and it's amortized over time. And then these gentlemen every now and then come in and can call them, restructure them, and so on. Exactly. And these figures are what? What we already have the first, the first box. Yeah. So the first box where it says, yeah, where it says existing debt service, yeah. it starts off at seven million three ninety nine. That's what you're currently paying. If that you, doesn't include you. No, right. no. The new issue will be about a million dollars more. So, yes. I'll I'll elaborate on that for the viewing public. Um, the first box. Uh, that's what we borrowed to redo the junior high school and high schools. 
and what Mr. Uh, Muscatello was talking about is in addition to this, it's going to be about another million dollars. So we're currently paying about 7.8 million a year out of our $109 million budget to service the debt. And to take out this additional money, we're going to add about another million dollars to service the additional bond. So I hope that clarifies for everybody. You'll have essentially $8 million out of $109 million of our budget going to pay off our uh, bonds. So next year's as is 25 would be 8.18 payment, right? 8.18 million? Yes. yes. And that payment goes to 8.9. Yes. yes. So it's about 720,000 increase. <clears throat> yes. Annual debt service payment. And then after three years, that's callable and reduced to seven five, right? I mean, that's fifteen million now, which allows us to do the HVAC that would um, fix the roof units at Turtle Creek and Wilkins. Danny and Brian, if I miss something, you know, um, the baseball softball complex, which has been passed due, tennis courts been passed due, right? Oh yeah, the throwing events. Um, we split up tracks, track runners perform at our high school. Right. The throwers get busted Wilkins, and it's just crazy. I can't believe we're also going to fix the lighting in the swimming pool, um, improve the field at Dixon, um, it, it put in additional security cameras at the Wolverina, uh, finish any locker room improvements that weren't finished, and then um, in the Rankin building, those repairs are coming out of that. Also, with that field, that third field was put in the high school, put in multi purpose practice field, like you know, there'll be soccer field and a football field out there. I think if any member of the public wanted to see the list, they could go to our agenda 15.1 under school finance and uh, it would be uh, exhibit C that has the complete list. Um, I was, uh, it's a pretty good list. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to note, these are not to exceed numbers, right? So if we're going out to request 15 million, it's because these projects, we hope to get them all through our bidding um, and RFP process to come in lower than that. And then we're only gonna obviously borrow what we need to cover those projects. I'm sure any parents from Edgewood that are listening can't hear us because they're doing a happy dance <laughs> for the air yeah. conditioning. The, that project alone is between five and a half and $6 million just for the air conditioning of the three buildings, of the three elementaries, but it's extreme, much it's much needed. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? questions? And Jeff um, is gonna talk about the legal side. In relation to what was on the um, agenda, the capital project, this exhibit C, this is everything that, Looking to be covered? Yes. Good. Yeah. Now, um, I have seen a figure of twenty million. We're not. We're not taking a twenty million dollar bond. It's to not exceed twenty million. Um, that was. Do you want to yeah. explain why that? Sure. I'm Jeff Mills. I'm your bond counsel, and with the firm of Cousin O'Connor, and uh, what I'm presenting tonight is really a resolution that Mr. Musk, the encapsulates what Mr. Muscatella is talking about. So next it's your meeting on the 20th, uh, every school district taxing body uh, county is governed by what's called the Local Government Unit Debt Act. So anytime a school district borrows money, it has to do everything in accordance with this act. Um, this resolution uh, tonight, which you'll pass on the 20th, it is very specific and then it has to get filed with Harrisburg for 20 days. Until that 20 days is approved, then you can close on the bond issue after that. But the state reviews um, every taxing body's filing. Um, so essentially, this resolution will, it says not to exceed 20 million. It'll be less than that. I, I believe the first bond issue will be uh, under 10 million to stay with what's called the bank qualified rules. And then in January, once you figure out the exact amount, if it's less than 15 or the exact amount, it'll be the, the, the difference. 
So uh, that'll be all set for your uh, meeting next week. Happy to answer any questions. And uh, your solicitor has re re reviewed this already. Could you repeat that again? What will be prepared for next week? This the resolution, which is what what, uh, and and that's going to be on your agenda to pass, and that that has to all be done in connection, like I said, with this local government of debt act advertised and filed with Harrisburg. I should ask Mr. Muscatel, I'm curious, um, this issue in addition to the 93 million we borrowed already, what is our total uh, capacity to borrow as we sit here tonight? <laughs> oh, your total capacity to borrow. Uh, you're, you're, you're well over 110 million in capacity left. Because okay, your borrowing right. capacity, yeah. I believe I don't have it in front of me, but it's close to 220 million. And then you take off what you already have. Right. So, yeah. As a rule of thumb, it's about your, your total revenues times 2.25. 2.25. Okay. So you have the ability to borrow 225. Less what you already um, have outstanding. Give or take. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> of course, well, um, one second. Any questions? I don't know who is it for, but the um, paperwork we have says 6%, coupon 6%. Got it. So that, that is the uh, not to exceed schedule. So we're not, we're not selling the bonds right now. So we're probably going to sell the bonds after we get the rating, after if the school district passes this resolution next week we'd be in a position to sell the bonds. Before we sell the bonds, we'll talk to the school district. That is an anticipation of the sale. So we always put numbers that are larger than what they are. So 6%, they're not gonna go over 6%. Right now we're looking at about 4% coupons. So the average cost on this is probably gonna be around 4.2, 4.3%, somewhere around there. That will be the, and the number of $20 million. See, bonds are sold this gets a little bit complicated. They're either sold with original issue discount or as premium bonds, depending on the interest rate and what the actual yield is. So you may be able to borrow $15 million, but we might only do a bond issue for 14 and a half. And what happens is if you have a 4% coupon and the real market is 3%, someone will pay you more for that bond because you're giving them 4%, but the market's 3%. So on you know a million dollars, you might only have to pay nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars for you know you pay they'll pay you no they'll pay you like a million fifty for the four percent so you get more money so depending on how we sell the bonds and that's up to the market it may or may not be fifteen million dollars it may be a little bit more than fifty or the bond issue may be a little bit more than fifteen million dollars or a little bit less than fifteen million dollars. But once we sell the bonds, we go through this with, with Jill and then the board president and the secretary all sign the purchase, uh, the amendment to the purchase contract. So we'll go over those and you'll see that the interest rates are less than what we said in that resolution and the amounts that were borrowed are less than what we say in that resolution. And that resolution encompasses both issues, the one that we would do in 2023 and the one we would do in 2024. Uh, as you, I don't know if you or the other gentleman mentioned about the interest rate and how the feds have raised interest rate a, a number of different times right. in the last year, two years. Is this a good time for us to be doing such a thing? Well, you never know when is a good time, but if you have to do the project, you need to borrow the money. And one of the reasons we suggested to the school district about splitting the issue was for that specific reason is that the call feature, if we would, if you would borrow all $15 million all at one time, you would be over bank qualified. You'd be over that bank qualified number of $10 million. So, and you would, you would have a 10 year call. So we wouldn't be able to refinance those for 10 years. By splitting it, you can refinance it within five years. So if interest rates do start to fall, <laughs> then you have the ability to do that because we don't know where interest rates are gonna be. If everybody says interest rates were gonna go higher, bet that they're going to go lower. You know, it's like, it's, you know, the public's always wrong in these things. So we don't know if the Fed's going to increase rates or they're going to start cutting. There's so many different opinions out there, but we're trying to mitigate, 
you know, of as much of the risk as possible by doing it as two issues. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, for, for us, when it comes to the um, list that's to be worked on, um, can, can any of this, is all of this a need to do? And, and if not, how much of it is a, we would like to do? So I, I can answer that. And I'm, I'm not speaking for you guys. If you want to come up with uh they have additional projects, plenty of projects that they would recommend. This was a list that we vetted and we debated and we trimmed down to what needed to be done now. There aren't any wants on that list in our opinion. I would recommend any of the board uh, walk around with uh, Brian and Danny and see the baseball, softball, see the tennis courts. I got to be honest, I was shocked when I saw the tennis courts uh, condition, long overdue. Um, Edgewood Elementary, HVAC, that's the biggest expense we have because... It's an old building. It's a tough building. That's why it never was a seed in the past. And so uh, we just thought if we're going to do this, you know, we can't keep go pushing on this way, especially with HVAC and the baseball softball complex. Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks, yeah. And I mean, the HVAC speaks for itself. That building is what it is. It's, you know, we've been getting calls about it for the last few weeks. Right. So th that is what it is. It speaks for itself. But if you go to the baseball softball complex and you stand on the softball side and you look down, there's a four foot drop to the baseball side. So now you're playing downhill on the softball side. You're playing uphill on the baseball side. The turf's probably as hard as this ground right now because it's past its time. Uh, and there's no way of fixing that just by coming in and putting more rubber in. It won't hold it anymore. So it's a hard surface. It's unsafe to play on. It's been unsafe for years. And we've been trying to get by by band-aiding it. Uh, we have drainage issues in that outfield. We've actually had to cancel games because of the drainage issues in an outfield on a turf infield. Uh, obviously, logistics of the throwing events, being bust over to Wilkins, that's that's not that doesn't play well because now you have sprinters that might throw things like that. So getting all that fill is going to also cut down on our cost of exporting all that dirt out. That you got to grade everything down because it'll be about a 13 foot drop now where the softball home plate sits. It'll go down about 13 feet. So we're going to take that fill and we got creative with that and we're going to put that on the outskirts of those hills. So now we can put walkways that are ADA accessible and things like that to get the dugouts and the stands for our fans and everything. Um, take the rest of that field, put it on the Pace Hillside, and that's where our throwing events are going to be. You'll have javelin, disc, and shot all on that hillside. And then the tennis courts, if you've been down there, I mean, they're they're crumbling. They're bad. They've been in disarray for years. Uh, they're not even safe to play on, probably even practice on. We're getting away with it right now. So those things are going to come into a complete million of that. We're going to turn them for the uh, tennis players next. Right now they hit in and out of the sun. They can't see half the time. So these are things that we assess that we think we need right away. Um, Obviously, for safety concerns, most important. And there are, like Doc said, we have a lot of other things we'd like to do, but for now, we feel these are the big things that we have to knock out of the park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, work and effort everybody put into this. I do wish along the way we, uh, or maybe we didn't, I'm not aware, had gotten some input from our public as to uh, what their thoughts are on these projects. Um, I don't know if that occurred or not, but going down the road, I wish we could uh, allow for that. Well, we filled plenty of complaints about our baseball softball complex in Edgewood. Uh, okay. Constant. So I'm, <laughs> we've heard about those a lot. <laughs> I also, I had this list on, on in May or June. It was on like one of my board tabs to that. It was on for the agenda meeting, which is always on a couple of days before and then the legislative meeting. So it is, I don't think it's changed. Has it Brian? Like, okay. So uh, that, that we live in Asia, the rest of the list that maybe we have okay. Okay, um, regist registered speakers. Um, Abigail Cartilage. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Abigail Cartilage and I've been um, in the district for about nine years and I'm just coming um, to, I'm not sure if everyone's aware, I had sent an email out, but I just also wanted to come in person um, to just make everyone aware of some busing situations that we're having um, and have several parents here 
to um, who also would like information about it. Um, but there's been several routes in the district that have just been canceled indefinitely. And um, the two options that I have been given are one to send my 10 year old daughter on a city bus, um, which you would have to take two separate buses to get to school. There is no um, bus route that directly goes to Trinity. So she would have to walk 20 minutes from um, Ardmore Boulevard, like and cross the main highway to get to school. And then the um, other option I was given was to um, basically find someone to take her to school. And I do not have anyone that you know, can do that for me. Um, and I just believe that it's the district's job and transportation job to find solutions for that. Um, let me just, yeah, and so I just, it's also interesting that the buses that have been canceled are only um, private school bus routes. And so I just like everyone to see if we can look into how we can reroute buses that are still running to accommodate for all students in the district to be able to go to school because I can't continue to call off work and miss work to have to transport my child back and forth um, to school. Um, and I did speak with the superintendent about it and he's been um, very informative and I appreciate the communication that um, I honestly wasn't expecting to hear back. So I appreciate um, you being able to email me, but I just wanted to figure out a way we could sit down and try and uh, make this work because it's six buses that have been just indefinitely canceled. And I understand there's bus driver shortages and that's just all across the board. There's shortages just in life due to COVID and I get that, but to not have your child have access to transportation, um, you know, if she was in middle school or high school, I could see sending her on the city bus, but she, you know, she's back there, she's 10 years old. She <laughs> is not gonna be able to, to do that. So I just wanted to, put that information out there um, and just be in the loop of what's going on. And I know they, we are looking, you guys are looking um, to find a new company or new, you know, drivers and I get that, but I just, we need solutions for the here and now of busing our kids. So. I appreciate your comments and I appreciate you reaching out directly um, just to give you an update. So we have first, we have a contract with first student and they have about 75% of our runs we use two garages for them. That's two total different fleets of staff. Then we uh, contracted with Christ Transportation, who has about 20% of our runs. There's a lot of our external runs and so on. They just had trouble getting manpower throughout the year. So um, in August, we contracted with ECS uh, or ETS or ECS. It might be, it might be ETS. ETS. Uh, we contracted with ETS. They took the runs they could take, which were Christ runs they couldn't take. Okay. Now, we had runs that we were promised at start of the year and then drivers backed out. And so that's what left us here. And now we're trying to contract with PA coach lines to pick up some runs. So okay. I'm hopeful that you know somebody is going to pick up drivers here, but we are really working. We're working with four vendors and five bus garages right now okay. to try to get it. And I wish I had an answer. I and I appreciate And it that. happens with our elementary runs and they have to double up and they pick our kids and that's up at 30. We could look at how we adjust like some of the buses that we do have running to accommodate, like, you know, times shifted, you know, kids are picked up later or earlier. And I know that's a lot of work, but that's why we have the transportation department to figure out those adjustments that need made. Yeah, it's it's tough. We bus 6,000 students a day and 3,000 in-house, 3,000 to other places in right. Battle in the City. It's just, it's just really... It's a it's a struggle. So I, I promise you, we are really pressing. I'm in every day reaching out to these bus companies saying where we at, where we at, where we at. It's it's tough. Okay, and I think it'll just be helpful to keep like families in the loop, so we don't. I mean, I know you don't have a set date of when this is going to end, but just like you know, we're looking at days, weeks, months. Because... I don't think the word indefinitely should have been used. Okay. I think that yeah, was that fine. probably was bad verbiage. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, okay. we because they are. Every single day, the entire transportation department calling whoever they can saying, can, do you have one driver? Please just yeah, one. Just, we'll just yeah. take one. Because I can't you know. afford to like keep taking off right. work. To, and we know, feel for you. Believe me. <laughs> nobody off, nobody so. on your side or our side wants this, likes this. It's it's awful. It's an yeah. awful situation. <laughs> okay. um, yes. But we we truly do feel you in, in, in our work. And as hard as we, I, we do have two drivers, they call it in the pipeline. But it takes two months to get your CDL to drive to drive kids, which 
good. Like we don't want to rush it, but still <laughs> you kind of want to say, can you speak yeah. up a little bit, you know? So yeah. well, I yes. That. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Nicole Craig. <clears throat> Hello, how you doing? Hi. Thank you for uh, letting me speak today. I will make it quick and fast. Um, my name is Nicole Craig, and I, I'm just reading what I wrote that way. I don't take up extra time. Um, I live on Calmont Drive in Wilkins Township, and my daughter attends Trinity Christian School in Forest Hills, and she's assigned to bus number 115, which is the bus um, that my co-parent was just uh, speaking of. Um, in 2022 and 2023 school year, the bus garage refused to send uh, bus 115 to take her to school. I drove her to and from school each day using hundreds of dollars of gas and added, adding unnecessary wear on our car. I called the transportation department each month to find out when bus 115 would start taking her to school and from school, and I was given excuses from the transportation department and the bus garage. This year, the bus only took her to school five days since August 23rd because of bus cancellations. We were notified this Monday that bus 115 and 118 no longer will provide transportation to Trinity School until further notice. This is a hardship, as you just heard from um, the lady who just spoke, uh, for parents who work or don't have other transportation for their child. For parents who work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., it's impossible to drive your child to and from work or to and from school. It's also a financial burden for us to pay extra money for gas to daily transport our children to and from school. I stand with all the parents who are here in the room today uh, who are assigned to bus 115 and 118 asking for the buses to start transporting and stop canceling transportation every day. Woodland Hills School District has collected hundreds of thousands of dollars in Trinity parents' school tax dollars, and we have a legal right for transportation for our children. I feel we have been discriminated against since we are the only buses that have been canceled um, for Trinity School. Uh, if transportation is not provided this week, we request that Woodland Hills School District can use our tax dollars that we already paid to provide gas money and other transportation um, for us to provide our transportation on our own based on the parents' distance to the school and back. And I, I understand did that. You, did you ever ask for the parent reimbursement? Because we do reimburse for gas. They, do, they, do, they do not do that. We do. We most certainly do. We, we, it's called parent reimbursement. I did ask for that. Yes. And um, I'm, I apologize. I have no idea why you would have been told that, but we absolutely do reimburse. Yeah, I asked for that last year, actually. It's, you, it goes by mileage and it goes yep. on the federal mileage That's report. That's what I was asking for last year. And you were told that we don't do that? Uh, the lady who was working last year, she no longer works for the department, the right. transportation department. I don't know why, but she's the one who told me that. She she quit. So, yeah. Okay. That, so we'll that get, is not we'll true. Some information and, to the office yes. at Trinity. Okay. Because um, we did we did offer mileage reimbursement to parents that bust their own children while we couldn't find buses. Okay. And I thought, because we had so much of that last year that I... I already thought you knew that for this year. So we, no. get that information. we can send the packet to Trinity so that you can get it there and, okay. and then get the information back to us. And yes. Okay. I mean, that, that would help me. hundred percent. Um, yeah. Um, but for people like the lady who has a job, that wouldn't help her because right. she wouldn't be able to get back and forth to work one time. Um, so that's one solution. And then also, you're, oh, go ahead. You're, your two minutes. Have, have oh, okay. That, that, that's fine. I, I just wanted to just let you know that it's really a burden and a hardship for us um, because people who can't drive their kid back and forth to school, what do they do for work? Honestly, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gabriel Burhill. Some of this was already clarified a little bit, but I, I wrote out some concerns and I'm going to read what I wrote. So my name is Gabrielle Verhill. I live in Churchill um, with my family. We have a fourth grader who also attends Trinity, Trinity Christian School. And I'm here tonight to ask for clarification, some of which was given, and solutions regarding the cancellation of his bus route. All that we've been told is that it's canceled until further notice and it's complicated and it's being worked on, but we don't know still how long it's going to be. And it's a big burden on a lot of Trinity families. So because it is the, the responsibility of the public schools to provide busing, if they're providing it for their own students, which you are, um, you need to find it for the private and the charter students because it is a big burden on us. Um, and we would like an explanation of the timing as soon as you possibly can. And I think it is urgent. And, um, and we would also 
like explanations of what's being done to rectify this? When will they be up and running? Why, why was the choice made to cancel the Trinity routes, especially given its convenient location to the Woodland Hills busing and Woodland Hills schools? If this doesn't have a solution that's coming soon, Will you be alternating what routes are canceled so that the same students aren't affected the whole time? As taxpayers, we're owed solutions and explanations, and we look forward to the forthcoming information. Thank you. Just one point of clarification. Um, mm -hmm. We don't pick runs and say, okay, we're going we're gonna to go after Trinity. Um, mm -hmm. that we uh, contract with outside companies. Drivers bid on runs. Mm -hmm. and then when a driver quits on a run 10 days into a school year, they don't switch drivers all around. It's like, okay, we have no driver for this run. Now we have to go find our driver. So I don't want anybody to think it's intentionally going after Trinity by any means. It was it was handed on our laps, and now we're trying to fix it. But we will communicate with your with your office with information Ms. Riggins talking about, and also updates on where we are with negotiations with PA Coach. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, public comment. Is there anyone in the room who would like to make a public comment at this time? Can you do that? Does that mean there will not be one at the end of the meeting? Public comments now. Yeah. When was that Is decided? It? Like how, I mean, I know that was last yeah. meeting, but like, was this said before the meeting like in somewhere else like executive session or something like that that we were going to change that it just appeared on the agenda it's, it's been like that it was like that last meeting too yeah it caught last me month it was it's so, traditionally not been that way right. we've usually had it at the end and in right traditionally at school boards they do it at the end so people can comment on things that happen during the meeting well my my thinking um was so you're, the rationale for moving public comment to now after registered speakers um, was in terms of if there was comments to be had on the agenda, those questions can be articulated now. And then when we actually go through the agenda, we can actually speak to those things. So you know, who you next have week, seen? four of them. And then and not after. Here you and after, you know and still that, that whatever amount of people after hearing the whole discussion, at the end, we'll they still have questions. I, I understand that they they actually and if they do, then they can they can actually uh, either there's mechanisms they can either contact us and ask the questions in many different ways. They can call, email, or they can ask them before the, the vote next week when we have public comment before that vote. So the, the rationale was simply to you know kind of streamline the communication. But who made that decision to change it? Because if, especially if board members aren't aware of it, who made that decision? That that was a decision that that I made uh, without previously. telling the rest of the board. I, I I communicated with with other board members. A, a couple that. of board members, not the full board. I would. I here's right. here's what I know. Here's what I know. If we voted on it now, um, that that um, we would we would have. Uh, Accepted the move of the public comment. With so, so when I make when I make, sometimes when I make a decision about something, it implies that um, I I have an understanding that uh, we're going to have the majority of the board support. You've already taken a poll. That's, Is it with um, board members who live in a district? Because Bridget and Tammy don't. Is there anybody okay. online? So public comment. What? So, so I gonna... think this should have just been communicated to the entire board a little different to save further comment. So it. moving forward, let's talk about this. And to, for today, let's live in today and move on with this meeting. I can, I can appreciate the, the uh, I'll, I'll own the, uh, the lack of communication there. There was a rationale behind it, which, which, you know, I, I did understand that others I felt like would, would uh, accept, but I did, I failed to explicitly communicate that mm -hmm. oh, and, and once go. again i don't think it was fair to the public at all that the uh there would not be comments open comments at the end of the meeting what well, and then when things are fresh in their minds and address situations that whatever they've heard whatever we talked about 
is just done for the same fair. Yeah, I don't agree with that, but, but I, I do understand that. You that I agree with Mr. Clanning and Bank for what it's worth. Yes. And if we're good at explaining things, then people will have fewer things to ask at the end, because some people might be anticipating something that we we could be explaining during the presentation of our meeting. Right. So having it traditionally at the end is really. And, and, and also the, the reality is at the end of meetings, if we're asking uh, uh, questions that are not going to be able to be addressed, then we the, the questions kind of dissipate into the air. There's questions now after people have had the opportunity to look at the agenda. The idea is to be able to, we can even speak to those things. I think the other obvious question you have to ask is how many public comments are actually about agenda items? Right. Which they usually aren't, they usually have nothing to do with the agenda. <laughs> Historically, we have Regardless, it's freedom of speech. Whatever you want to well, yeah, I agree. So, so I don't sorry. disagree, but, but the rationale of moving it was they could speak on agenda. That's why we post the agendas Friday. People could see the agenda. And then, you know, it's up to the board. I mean, well, you can have public we, comment, whatever. We but, disagree. We we disagree on when but where public comment is. I get it, right? But I mean, that's that's okay. And I, you know, you said your piece. Well, no, we, I, I said some of my piece. Okay. You you have more to say? Yeah. As I was saying, mm -hmm. people have their opinion about what we say during these meetings. And while it's fresh in their mind, you get up to that podium and speak it at the end of the meeting and voice it, whether it can be answered or not. That's their, their time to express their opinion and ask questions. And put those questions on the floor to the point where, where like you can, meetings, can direct them where to go to get the answers. So, but to, so to, I to end it, to, to do it this way and have them out of their free time, out of their life, to try and track somebody down to ask a question when they can do it right here, just. Well, I, 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 okay, so we don't, I don't necessarily want, we don't need to necessarily further. We can agree to disagree, but for tonight, can we please move forward? I, I just, yeah, I just want to say that. We have a forum where we can do this. We do, we could. We could discuss that, and in my community, in fact, in fact, we'll have a robust conversation about about this, and so that you'll you'll know fully what the rationale is. But I I I would say that um, um, we both have a disagreement on where public comment should be, and we can kind of move on from there. Can we include committee meetings in that discussion too? We we can include. Okay, you know, thank. Uh, you. We've been clear on that, but uh, that that's fine too. We I think definitely. that needs to be more of a we public discussion speak. because it's being just left in. Things are being left back in executive I, I, Com committee meeting. This or wherever that was, that conversation took place. Yeah, I've spoken on the record plenty of times about the, uh, com committee meetings and the rationale uh, for them. So, uh, but I do, I do just to add some comment. So I do know that Mrs. Carnes has been taking the training <laughs> to be the board secretary, and one of the things is that public comments should be up in the beginning so that they have a right to comment on it before the voting on the legislative night. So if you do it at the end of legislative voting night, then they miss their opportunity. So that was one of the reasons, and I'm, she's sitting over there not wanting to say anything, but I know that that's why, like she, she brought it up in her training that we were doing it wrong. So like it, you know, Right. Sorry, Cal. <laughs> like I said, like however, the PSPA <laughs> says it's traditionally done at the end of the meeting. So maybe your training is different from ours. Yeah, like I said, I, yeah, I'll own the the not. Uh, you know, sometimes in my head, I'm thinking, you know, just make things more efficient and, and move on now. So, yeah. um, in the future, I'll keep that in mind. All right. Is anybody online? Online. Question. Mr. Jeffers. Yes, uh, I had a question about the community center um, with Make your address, please. Uh, 664 Mercer Street. No one else gave theirs, but that's fine. The um, my question is. Gave it ahead what, of time. Thank you. What's the exact budget for the um, repairs at the community center in Rankin? And um, how much is going to be spent? You know, the uh, on these you know repairs, what's the yearly budget 
the budget for, you know, staffing, security, whatever, what have you. And it was the paving already done, or is it going to be done with the money that we're seeking the bond for? Paving was already done. It's not part of the bond financing request. Uh, paving was, I'm no, it is. Ballpark numbers. Yes, it is. Oh, is it part of it? It okay. is. Okay, mm -hmm. I apologize. We're paying it through the bond. Correct. Um, the paving was completed, what, then last, last week? Uh, 60000 ballpark. Uh, the rest of the repairs internal, 20000 all right, so we're probably at eighty as a top end number. Uh, yeah, and, right. And I and I may I may have missed it in a board meeting, but I don't recall anyone um, putting in a bid to, to perform that paving there. I may have missed it. It may have been in a board tab item that I didn't see or we know did about. ask for we did ask for requests for proposals from three different companies, which our uh, facilities department did receive, and we did pick uh, the bidder from those bid numbers was it presented though and voted on in a board meeting no we that's we usually present. not yeah. done that way um when we decide to do a repair which was part of the initial discussion when we were talking about taking this bond that was one of the the situations that were discussed that it needed to be repaired it is our building if we mo don't make these repairs and someone gets hurt then we're going to be liable for that oh i i, I, I understand but the, when the high school so, parking lot was paved it was discussed thoroughly that was part of the big um high school project is that what you mean correct um recently within the past few months they had discussed you know um mr finney had made several presentations on, you know, the bidding and who was going to do the paving, how much it was going to cost. And, um, you know, it was voted on to go with, you know, company X for this amount of money. And I was just confused why that wasn't done with the Rankin building as well. Well, we do have limits. Anything that is going to be over $250,000 has to go out for a formal bid. This was nowhere close to that amount. We just do um, RFPs. Anything that is between $10,000 and $250,000, that's the, that's the rules for the bidding. So that that's why we do it the way we do it. That's the way everybody does it. Now, does, does that require a vote any that on anything over $10,000? No. We have to do business as everybody does business in, in the world. We, we can't wait to ask permission to make every single improvement that we're going to do. That's why we have a budget. That's why we put numbers in the budget. And that's why we did come to the board with this list, which that was on the list and said, these are the things that we want to do with this money. And they agreed to it. They, they agree that that needed fixed. Okay. If that's your answer. It is. Is, it, is there anyone else? Who's that? Ms. Rizuski, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thanks. Thank you for uh, taking my comment. Um, just okay. because uh, I've been saying- We do need your address, Ms. Rizuski. It's 2222 Columbia Avenue, Swissville. Um, that's okay. actually not a requirement. There was a uh, lawsuit in Bucks County that uh, has said that that's not a requirement anymore. Um, so I, I hope that you will take your uh, cue from the PBSA at some point uh, to stop asking people for their addresses. Anyhow, um, just to also hop in on this debate that you're having about when public comment should be, public comment should be at the same time at every meeting. And if there's gonna be a change, it should be announced ahead of time. And also if the thing is, is that you want to have people that want to speak to agenda items, um, speak before you go through the agenda. That is what the registered speakers is for. And if you think that there's not enough time or there aren't uh, people aren't aware of what they need to do to become a registered speaker, then you need to advertise that. And then you can still have public comments at the end of the meeting, like there's always been. And there's two times for a public to comment. Not there's not two times there's not two times for the public to comment twice I can't comment again um, after this meeting is over. But so speaking of which, here's my comment. Uh, $20 million is 20% of the annual budget of this school district. And it is being talked about as a line item, agenda item vote. That is so ridiculous to put it as a consent vote. This is 20 million dollars that is going to become 41 million dollars by the time it's paid back and there needs to be public discussion about what 
the priorities are and what needs to be done. I am really disgusted that um, projects were approved and projects apparently like paving at the Rankin building have been done without an idea of how they're gonna be paid for, except for this possible up to $20 million of new brand new debt, which is coming after teachers have been furloughed and a tax cut that seems so absolutely beyond. Uh, why does the school, a school that's in such great financial health need to borrow this giant amount of money? I think there needs to be a real look at reprioritization and the public needs to have big public meetings as has been Thank done you. before Thank for you. big You're projects like this. Just in short, these are, I think Mr. Belmont referenced 90 million that was taken out to remodel the high school and the middle school. These are projects that have long been overlooked for years. Uh, many parents have been very outspoken over the AC project at Edgewood. It is expensive because the building never had it. So you can't want things and then not want to pay for things. That's just the cost of doing business in the school. And our facilities are outdated and unsafe in some areas. We are in a strong financial position and we're able to do it. We can do that while offering a tax breaks to the citizens. When the financial experts review it and agree that our bond rating is strong and stable, that's a strong indication that we are doing the right things. So I think I'd also like to comment that they are two different pots of money, if you will. The general fund pays for everyone who works here, everybody who educates the children, everything that we do for the children. The capital projects is a totally different set of, it's a, it's a different pot of money that must be used for projects to keep our buildings running, keep them safe, keep them healthy for everybody who comes onto our campuses in, in any ca capacity. So the tax cut and the furloughs were for the general fund to keep the general fund healthy. It has nothing to do with the capital projects fund. It is two totally separate and unique sets of money. And this is how school districts and all public municipalities function. You have a general fund and you have a capital project fund. So they are two totally different things. So you, you are not permitted to take money from the capital projects and pay people in the general fund. You just are not. And it makes no sense to take money from your general fund to pay for a $5 million air conditioning project that is absolutely necessary for the health of our students. This is how school districts work. This is how you get money to pay for huge projects to do capital improvements. Okay, so we have two voting items on the agenda. You want me to go to those first and then we can go back through this. Okay, so if we can skip down to item 7.1. Ms. Kesma, we want to welcome you to the Woodland Hill School District. Uh, we're going to ask tonight for a motion and a second to approve uh, Michelle Kesmer as assistant principal at Wilkins Steam Academy. Uh, her salary is listed there with a start date to be determined by her sending school district. Uh, Ms. Kesmar was vetted mostly by our elementary principals and then our central office, and she is the recommended candidate for the position. So any questions from the board? Ms. Corrins, you could roll call that.
I expected to see something like that by the time we got here and I still haven't. So even the public doesn't know what is, you know, exactly how much this is going to cost, which programs are supposed to be in the, um, in the center. So how is it that we're even, because it's not even about the um, person, but like, how are we hiring when we don't even know what we're hiring for or how much any of this is going to cost? So I don't think it's a good idea for us to hire anyone um, or even create a position before we find out exactly what it is that it's supposed to be and how much that's going to cost the district, because not everyone's going to be okay with that. I have sent seven or eight emails to the board since we've had this ideas. And I always end it with, please let me know if you have any questions about this position to which you never ask any questions. It's like you only have access to me at the night of board meetings, but what you can certainly ask any questions about that. But Okay. So position is that why is there no proposal for ranking and why don't we know how much money it's going to cost the district? Several proposals for ranking. If you're asking we're, we're, me about security costs and custodial costs, I can provide no, you with that. We No, there should be a formal proposal. We should know exactly what this is going to be. And we don't. This was a board vote that I presented to the board months ago that it, was approved. It that, was not a thorough, there's not a thorough. But then you should have voted no. That's That was so that we can start um, construction on it, or at least repairs for it, because it, sh- it has well, been. The vote you approved was to make the Rankin Palmer <laughs> School into a Rankin Community Center, and there was plenty of details. I provided months of communication back with the board that I could show. Okay, well, how much is it going to cost? You should know that. Okay, so so where is it? We're gonna we're gonna move move on with the vote. Yeah, we're, this but, is about but, him but, being hired. Right. Position. No, it's we're not gonna about him. Vote. And actually, and actually, and actually, <laughs> um, so. Your your point's not not totally um, with, without merit. I think that I think that um, when we uh, we we do need to look uh, deeper when we start programming and things along those lines, looking at what we're gonna you know ultimately put into it. There, but there's a there's a matter of um, you know in some ways we're creating this. Maybe there's you know there, there's gonna be a um, you know uh, a thorough discussion about what we do when we start. We already have I'm sorry. in it. Um, and, uh, you know, so a lot of it's going to be predicated on a community board discussion. So I think we can move on and have a better discussion about that at another time. Uh, was there a motion and a second already? Yes. Okay, so please call the vote. Mrs. Arthrow. Yes. Mr. Belmont. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Mr. Clanagan Bay. Yes. Dr. McMillan. Mr. Rensland. Yes. Ms. Creech. Yes. Ms. Reed. Abstain. Mr. Scott. Yes. You have to typically give a reason for your abstention. Lack of information. That's there you go. So, cur- all right, we're going to go to cu- curriculum, back to curriculum. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Congratulations, Mr. Ford. You're welcome to have you on board. Congratulations, OB. You want to say anything? <laughs> uh, thank you. This is my second time here. I was a little nervous there. <laughs> I'm ex- it's exciting. It's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. You're great. Have a good night. Mr. Wilson. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, there are 10 items under curriculum this month, but luckily six of them are required by law and relatively simple. Uh, 4.1 is that we seek approval of the Woodland Hills School District Pre-K Counts Child Care Collaboration Agreement. As you know, we have an amazing Pre-K Counts program. We run four of those pre-K counts classrooms and Heritage runs the fifth. We have a total of five pre-K counts classrooms, 90 scholars in our district attend pre-K counts uh, that is that we are responsible for in the district. We are only allowed to accept that grant and accept the extra classroom that Heritage uh, runs if we have a, a board approved pre-K counts collaboration agreement with them. Um, so. It is a, a requirement for the grant. Any questions? 
4.2, also a requirement, but for our consolidated application for our title funds, we seek approval to ratify a contract agreement with Allegheny Intermediate Unit, AIU-3, to provide services for non-public schools as per federal programs. So 4.2, 4.3, 4.4, 4 4.5, and 4.10 are all the same exact motion, but with different vendors. As you know, title funds, any federal funds, require that um, non-public schools receive a portion of those funds for any uh, low-income scholars that are at their schools from our district. There's a proportion, it varies depending on Title I, Title II, Title IV, or our ESSER dollars. They all require a, a pass-through. However, we're not allowed to give funds directly to a non-public school. So what we have to do is contract with their vendors for professional development, for uh, curriculum, for all of those things. We contract with their vendors, the vendors invoice us directly, and we pay those, those invoices. But we have to have contracts with them that are included as part of our consolidated debt. So 4.2 is an agreement with the IU. Any questions? 4.3 is the same thing, but an agreement with Catapult Learning. Any questions on that one? 4.4 is the Midwestern Intermediate Unit 4. I believe Universal Academy is specifically using MIU 4. Any questions on that one? And 4.5 is Sound Foundations to Reading Instruction, LLC. Any questions on that? Okay. Shout out to one of our non-public schools, Universal Academy. Uh, Ms. Sharuk Bador is running that school and has really varied the level of, of PD and curriculum to ensure that her scholars are getting what they need. So it uh, used to be that all you saw here was AIU, and then non-public didn't spend any of that money. We've been we developed a collaborative relationship with the Universal Academy specifically, as well as the Diocese of Pittsburgh. And we feel like they're doing a lot more than used to be done with these funds. 4.6 is always a crowd pleaser, maybe brings a little levity and, and love to the room. We seek approval to create an open purchase order not to exceed $5,000 each for Edgewood, Turtle Creek, Wilkins, and Dixon this year to supply every scholar with one book from the Scholastic Book Fair. Yeah. We started this, <laughs> we started this uh, in the fall of 2021. We do it twice a year. And it, as Ms. Arthrell has pointed out, is a, um, is a really big thing to, to most of our families. Um, it's a big deal in my household. It's a big deal in all households. We no longer have scholars that come down to the book fair and have to sit over in the corner because they didn't have the money or they didn't bring them up. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yes, sir. If we can. Want to go back? Yeah, do I do. I thought so. I saw we lost the Zoom. I was a little sad because I was on a roll. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Four or five. Yes, sir. Could you just speak to what that um, LLC is that we're working with there and, and yeah. what, what need they're looking to meet? Absolutely. Yes, sir. So uh, Universal Academy, which is the only non-public school uh, that uses our title funding in our, our geographical um, catchment zone, uh, they receive Title II and Title IV funding from us. So Title I funding is any scholar that lives within the district that goes to a non-public school, wherever they go, we send funds to those schools. So the Diocese of Pittsburgh, we're sending funds uh, 50 and 60 miles away sometimes for those scholars. Title II and Title IV specifically, Title IIA and IA specifically refer to non-public schools that are within the geographical catchment zone of the district. The only one of those that has um, low-income students, title, scholar, title scholars that chooses to, to participate is Universal Academy. Universal Academy has found sound foundation to reading instruction as their professional development provider. So they work with all of their teachers to make sure that they're going through the science of reading and structured curriculum in order to ensure that scholars are receiving effective reading. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great question. 
4.7, we, uh, we received an award, a grant from the Wallace Foundation to be a part of the District Summer Learning Network uh, partnership, which includes over 100 districts from around the country that are committed to providing um, high quality summer learning to scholars. And as part of that grant, we um, they've offered to pay for up to three individuals from the district to attend the National Summer Learning Association Conference in Washington, D.C. Last year, Ms. Scarberry and myself attended. This year, I know that Ms. Scarberry will attend trying to find child care for Ms. McGee, whose birthday it is, by the way. Happy birthday, Ms. McGee, um, so that she can go. Uh, I'm not able to go because it's the same day as our multi-district professional development where we'll have 700 educators from other school districts coming to the high school. Um, but it's, it was really beneficial last year and helped us to, to really uh, proactively plan for Opportunity Camp in a way that we haven't been able to do before. So it's a great opportunity and it's at no cost to us. Any questions? Okay. 4.8, I wish I could take credit for 4.8, but it was actually brought to us uh, by Mr. Greenwich, our ninth and 10th grade principal at the high school. We seek approval to partner with Dr. Doug Kostowitz from the University of Pittsburgh to recruit four to six educator volunteers who want to learn additional classroom management skills to participate in his study. So Dr. Kostowitz actually uh, focuses on building positive classroom culture and climate and has a series of videos and professional developments and trainings that he's offered to our educators. Mr. Greenwich knew him uh, from his previous role at Alderdice and asked him if he would make some of those videos available to us at a cost. And Dr. Costa would say, well, instead of doing it at a cost, since we already know we want teachers to volunteer, we're not gonna force this on any educators. We want teachers to volunteer. Why don't we ask them to volunteer at no cost? And then that will give me the opportunity to go in and collect data from their rooms as to whether or not what they're learning from me is working. Um, so it's a, it's a, I think it's a win-win. So it's now no cost to the district and Dr. Kostowitz gets data um, on purely based on educators who volunteer to take his professional development. So um, I think it's a, a great opportunity for our educators who, who want to do that. Any other questions here? Dr. Kostowitz is here to answer any questions if anybody has more specifics. His studies uh, is going through the entire IRB process through Pitt. So it's it's very rigor, rigorously um, looked at in, in detail before it's approved. We, we wouldn't do anything that might um, jeopardize FERPA or the de-identification of data or any of those things. Yes, sir? What is the study? Yep, Dr. Koskowitz, you want to speak to it or? Well, sure, the study uh, looks at how teachers interact and trying to build more positive, proactive interactions with kids rather than reactive, negative interactions with kids, thus building a better climate that can hope for better in educational outcomes. So it's not adjusting anything with teaching, it's just adjusting how and where we invest our attention with kids and try to be more positive and proactive rather than negative and reactive. You're saying the individuals already have that skill and they're looking to help? So everyone's praised someone before, right? Great job. It's the systematic and tactical use of that versus yelling at kids, getting into arguments with them over sometimes very inconsequential things, but because we aren't necessarily used to that. We want to, hey, take out your book. And the child says, no, I'm not going to. And then we get into a long argument. What are we doing with that moment? We're taking a moment, making it way, way worse. Not to mention mental health issues. Definitely. Mental health trauma. So many teachers know how to teach. <laughs> and it comes really hard when we get into the interactions. We get sucked into these arguments. And then we get teacher burnout. I'm giving up on kids, and so it's a different way of investing that in that in that attention. So the teachers 
can feel like they're contributing more. And the kids, we actually like to be around people that are kind of a little bit nicer to us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's doing what they do already and being more systematic with it. And then through that feedback that I would give them, they can see that performance over time. Four to six educator volunteers. Right. Right. Are you looking for people in, in our district or are you bringing people in? No, no, no. The teachers here. So this would be when, when I talked with uh, Mr. Greenwich, I said, I can help some teachers that we have. And then my goal is to hopefully teach some teachers and then have those teachers support other teachers and then become a model that it's your model. It's not me. That's the end goal. Question? Sure. Uh, by the way, you've picked a prime age, nine and 10 is that, uh, <laughs> nine and 10 is that, age. but you can guarantee that our teachers will not be forced. It's purely no. voluntary. It's purely voluntary and they can stop at any time. It would be up to them. So. Thank you. And the, the data cannot be used for evaluative purposes right. or as any part of their Act 13 or an operation form on the Thank you. That's, that's of a concern. Yes, ma'am. I made that very clear that this is, they're not going to volunteer if this is something I'm going to use against them. <clears throat> but there a racial uh, component to this and how you can make it diversity? Um, I would look at it more. You see much of the inconsequential stuff that's generally in a classroom can be dealt with by manipulating how we attend, right? I don't need to yell at you. I can, you know, if you don't want to take out your book in this moment, if I wait a few seconds, but usually we don't wait. And so it doesn't matter what's going on. I mean, it's, it works with all kids regardless. So it's not really a focus on any type of race, ethnicity, anything. It's trying to focus on being more positive and proactive to all the kids regardless. And then trying to look at those behaviors and say, is this something? Now, this is obviously not the stuff that's dangerous or anything that can't, it would hurt someone. This is a kid saying, no, I'm not gonna do this thing. That can trigger a whole line of events that can make poor outcomes for the teacher and poor outcomes for the child. Any questions, Dr. Castro? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. The last one that's not required by law, but that I'm extremely excited about is that we seek approval to partner with the Pittsburgh Penguins and the U.S. Steel to offer their Reading Champions program to all Woodland Hills School District third grade scholars. So for those of us that uh, grew up in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, we remember Pizza Hut had Book It. And if you read a certain number of books, you got a coupon to go get some pizza at Pizza Hut. Well, the Penguins and U.S. Steel have upped that game. And every third grader in Woodland Hills will have a goal individually. And then every class will have a goal. And the, at the end of an eight-week period, it starts in October, the classes and the students that meet their goals fully will get two free tickets to Penguins games. And then they're much like Book It, there are benchmarked goals where, you know, after two weeks, if you've read your goal, then you get a, a puck and a pennant and you would get... Uh, visits from the iceberg, the penguins, mascot, things like that. It's a great program. It's absolutely free to us. Uh, they reached out to us because of the great things that, that we're already doing and said, hey, we think that this could be a good, good idea for your kids. So um, I tried to get them to do third, fourth, and fifth grade. Unfortunately, it's only third grade, uh, but it's a great opportunity for uh, approximately 250 of our kids. Any questions on the Reading Champions program? And then the last one is another one that's required by law. We were just a little bit late on getting the uh, contract with Mount Oliver, so it went to the end of the agenda. Um, but we seek approval to ratify a contract with Pittsburgh Mount Oliver, IU2, to provide services for non-public schools as per federal programs. Any questions? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Equal personnel. Dr. White.
Good evening, everyone. I have uh, three agenda items. Item 6.1, we seek approval to enter into a three-year agreement with Wesley Lyons, West Lyons, the Pursuit LLC for motivational character development for sixth graders at a cost of 65,000 for all three years. So that'll be a total of three years. Um, and I think what's nice about the program is Mr. West, he does a nice job of connecting with the students. Um, and our target population is our sixth graders. And we know that middle school is some of the toughest years for our scholars. So uh, his program will seek to help our students as they transition throughout uh, their middle school years. Any questions? One, one oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. So that'll be a total for th three years. No, I think he means, uh, no, it'll, annually, he's not getting a lump sum in the first year. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, no. Three. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's divided up over three years. Yeah. Sorry. Just go ahead. Um, just to be clear, I see sixth grade in the description, then the attachment mentions sixth grade and then in eighth, eighth grade. grade. Yes. It's going to be sixth grade. Just correct? sixth grade. Yes. So, I think that was a typo. Uh, extra Mile Foundation. What is that? Extra, extra Mile Foundation. The write up says um, that the. Um, Maybe it's like there's something here for Extra Mile Foundation. That's another foundation that I work with, and we work in the diocese, so they support the diocese. Yeah. Um, so we work with preschool in the diocese through the extra mile foundation. So that might be something that would just carry over or something that we could put out of the back. And what about the standards? What are the standards? Is there a paperwork we can get on that? Uh, just career readiness standards. So we, whenever we develop this program, as we advanced it, we worked with uh, West Orland County and the unit, and they just took a look at different uh, state standards and they kind of compared the program to a lot of the standards as we were building up some character development and improvement. Mr. Lyons, your program, I know you have sixth graders only, but they stay with you. So last year, sixth graders, since it's, there's an online component, a mentoring component, component leadership component, they stay with you as they move through the yeah, yeah, so they can continue. As we build this three-year plan and why that's so important is so we continue to build with these students. Uh, the students do receive curriculum that they can continue to access and utilize so they can go anywhere. And this is, this is something that we more recently developed, especially in the years of 2020 when things went a little bit more virtual where we were able to work with students in a longer capacity that way. And I don't know if this may be more for Dr. White or you. How will we know the success? Is there a data or paperwork that's ever been collected? So I actually uh, require, I'm, I just started this towards the end of the summer, requiring all programs that we have in a district to submit data to us. So he will be required to submit certain data to ensure that he's actually doing what he's saying he's doing. So. Hello. Hey, Wes. Yes. So, how are you? Well, how are you doing? I can hear you speaking to that microphone. I'm good, baby. I have a question for you. Is this program somewhat of a, um, I want to call it a grand extension of what you did a couple years ago? Was that at the junior high or the high school? Pursuit of, fill in the blank for me. With patience. Pursuit of, what was it? Yes, yes, yes. Is, is that what? Yeah, so this ties in together. So The Pursuit with Patience is a book that I wrote. So each student receives a book. Uh, this mm -hmm. is something that was released in 2012. And then we started programming with Wooden Hills initially, where we work with the school district, their board members, their uh, educational specialists, everybody uh, from the former superintendents. And we started to develop curriculum. And as we built that curriculum out is, is how we initially got started. So all this is going to be based from the book and then... Uh, it, it developed into a curriculum working with different educators. And then that was 10 years ago now. So it just continued to expand and develop from there. And but I wanted you to elaborate on that. Not that I didn't know what you were talking about. I just yeah. needed you to elaborate on that because my daughter, Ricky, who is now a junior in IUP, was yep. in your program. 
and she has been nothing but successful. She has referred to your book several times for different things, you know, and um, I'm glad to see you again. Yes, uh, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad to hear that she's doing well too. But when, whenever I look at the program, that's what we do. We build relationships with the students. Um, you know, they, they may reach out after school. They may reach out on social media. They may reach out on Snapchat or something like that. Just because the, the, one of the big goals that I have is to initially is build a relationship. Just once that relationship is established, then I can educate. Then I can start giving them information. Then we get some results. So we can analyze just what we've really done with this. One of the things that I want is, is a relationship being built. I want to make sure we're taking the time to build that relationship with our students. You've done a good job, Wes. Thank you. Uh, any, any questions from me from the board? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank All right, you. thank you. I'm going to put this microphone down. All right, item 6.2, we seek approval to renew the contract with One Nation uh, mentoring as proposed. Um, so uh, as Mr. Clanagan Bay asked, how will it be evaluated towards the end of last school year? I did request that all of our providers in the district provide me with uh, specific data. Um, one Nation was one of our most requested programs to bring back. Uh, Mr. Manning spoke highly of them. Ms. Ebony Taylor, our social worker in the middle school, she was like, please, Dr. White, is One Nation coming back? Um, they've done tremendous work in our building. Um, just last year alone, they met consistently with 43 students for like mentoring, academic check, wellness, and health. They had over 802 contacts uh, with students. So that's over 802. And then this year, they are looking to structure the time that they spend with students um, and focus more so on life skills, relationships, social media, mindfulness, and you know how to really communicate with their, with their uh, teachers. Uh, they do. One of the things that I am requesting from many of our providers is how are you going to connect with our families? Because a lot of times we bring them in and they work with the students, but our families are left out. And so they are planning to have a parent night for families as a part of their program. Um, they uh, just I've witnessed them. They come every single day um, and they're only supposed to stay in a cafeteria. Uh, or just during uh, lunch hours. And, you know, Mr. Manny can attest to the fact that they came and they stayed literally all day. Um, and they really helped solve and stop some of the major issues that occurred in the middle school. So they are just a tremendous organization. Any questions? Um, what, uh, how long have they been around? Uh, they, and they were here last year. Last year was the first year. Mm -hmm. Uh, last item, 6.3, we seek permission to purchase the Unified Home Attendance Intervention Suite subscription through PowerSchool for the purpose of improving and closely monitoring our attendance at a cost of $34,033.75. Uh, this school year, I did ask all of, our, all of the departments that fall under me to um, create goals for our departments. Um, and so last week I met with our social workers and we shared out on what those goals will be. And every single social worker um, in our building had an attendance goal. And so it just shows that they're really passionate about really trying to improve our chronic absenteeism rate. Um, I had an opportunity to look at our rate from last year and 38% of our students were considered chronic absenteeism. What that means is over 38% or that means 38% missed over 10% or more of school. And that equates to about 18 or more school days. Um, a nice feature, nice features of the program. It uh, generates uh, postcards. Uh, we can no longer, we don't know, we no longer have to send out mailings in the mail. Uh, that's cost, costly. Uh, we can send them electronically. Uh, it generates letters and using positive language. So a lot of the letters that we were previously sending sent out, you know, said things like your child is illegally absent. So that scares a lot of our, fa our families. Um, and so it uh, basically sends out letters using positive language. It helps build connections with our, our families. It, it will help us track our attendance more consistently. Um, the, the thing that I love the most was you can actually initiate mass wake-up calls to specific students. I know when I was at the high school, uh, I personally would call students, especially like our seniors, and be like, are you up? Get to school. Seniors who were, you know, in jeopardy of not graduating, let's go get to school. So that's that's what I enjoyed the most about it. Um, and then on the flip side, 
it doesn't just focus on the negatives. It also pinpoints students who actually are coming to school. And so we'll be able to communicate with families and say, you know, good job, you're, you're here. Uh, so I'm really excited about the program. And I think it's a good start to trying to uh, correct the issue that we have. Um, is there any way to get a, get, or I should say, is there any um, um, information on the breakdown of how the money is being used? in um, all of them, one nation and? Uh, the contracts, their contracts are in here. Um, you can look at that. Uh, in terms of the intervention suite subscription, uh, it's gonna be used to really closely analyze our data, send out uh, information to families about their attendance and things of that nature. Like one nation, you know, are there line items? Are there, is the money divided up in line items? So when they submit their uh, when they submit their agreement or their MOUs, uh, they don't necessarily have to break down line items. Um, but I, I do know, like One Nation, they're there every day, uh, and just their presence alone, they they spend a lot of time in those buildings. But they will be doing like mentor mentoring. Uh, they will be doing uh, mentorship groups. Um, they help uh, break. I don't want to say vice, but they help, you know, problem solve in school and things of that nature. So there's no paperwork that says um, 10,000 going to tutoring, uh, 5,000 going to food, that type of thing. No. Yeah, their, their, their cost of the program is 75,000, which is two assigned mentors to Dixon daily. And oftentimes they actually had all three of them came. Yeah, so it's more than. I want to say that that's a bargain for what you described them doing. Yeah. And our children are worth every penny. I mean, and, and when I say they were there, I, I witnessed them. They they were there daily and they put out a whole lot. They helped put out a whole lot of fires last year. I, I can see they're showing up to my school and they're like me today. I mean, they were here today. And, and I just want to say, I just want to pose a question. Um, there's never an issue with any of the board members going to visit the school so they can kind of do their own research, is there? Right, Miss Dr. White? Uh, to my knowledge, no. All right, because I go all the time. Thank you. They're there, they're there every always day. always a thing. Like, <sighs> never mind. All right. On uh, 6.3, mm -hmm. the uh, power school program, the uh, I see the cost, and there's a three-year contract. Is that cost per year? Is that for the duration of the contract? I believe, is that, is that, that was for, yeah. yeah. Okay. And we did take a look at another program, um, but number one, we use power school. Um, and then number two, the other program was charging us for, a certain amount of letters. Um, and we just had concerns about the fact that we may go over those letters. So it costs us more money. So we thought power school would be more effective, especially since we already use power school. Any questions? Thank you. All right, thank you. Personnel. Good evening. 7.1. We've already, you've already approved uh, Ms. Kesmer. So congratulations and welcome to the district. So 7.2, personnel, section A, authorization for leaves, section B, authorization for retirement resignations, section C, authorization to hire professional staff, section D, authorization to hire non-professional staff, section E, authorization for transfers, section F, authorization for EDR mentor actions, Section G, authorization for miscellaneous. Section H, authorization for recall furlough. Obviously that tab will be updated due to the recalls that we're going to be making tomorrow. Any questions would require um, executive session. So are there any questions or a need to go back to exec? Yes, Mr. Flanagan Bay? Uh, section D, uh, Is that the position that was discussed in the back room? D5, he said D like dog five. That's a support position. No. Or no. No. 
So maybe my, um, you say that's the support position? Are you referring, is that the initial position we were re discussing in exec? Say again, please. Was that the position we were discussing regarding the other employee? Yeah. The, uh, yes, but we shouldn't have a discussion on the floor regarding it. That's not. The D05 is a 12-month position. He's asking, was that the previous position that we discussed in exec? Yes, to answer that question. Is that all you have? Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Building in grounds. We are. We're going to tag team this one tonight. I think I got some papers too. So 11.1 .1 is we seek a motion to approve request for facility usage. Any questions on that? Uh, Item 11.2, we seek approval to accept uh, a maintenance contract with Huckenstein to take care of all of our boiler maintenance, start up, and um, come back a second time to make sure everything's operating correctly. Any questions? Okay, 11.3 um, is an existing contract that we want to uh, renew with uh, Johnson Controls for maintaining our chiller plants at the Dixon and the high school location. Any questions? And the last one is a barn burner. It's 11.3, uh, <laughs> it's um, $158 to have all the lights except for the pole lights for the fields to be retrofitted to LEDs, high efficiency, lamps and fixtures for the price of $158 for labor and material. Any questions on that? Uh, all right. That was 10.4? 11.4. 11.4? Yeah. All right. I do have a question on that. I noticed that the final number on that estimated the word estimated connected with all that. Uh, estimated project amount, estimated project rebate, estimated project total. For the lighting? Yeah. That's a firm number, $158. I contacted the contractor because I was wondering the same thing. But uh, that's all. As far as I know, from what I've been told, it's $158 to relamp all the locker rooms, all the canopy lighting, and So is there any, given that the word estimated use, is there any possibility of it being more? We're not going to cut a check for any more than $158 or $158 purchase order. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Eleven point five. We seek a motion to accept a multi-purpose field proposal from Force Two to Turf Solutions and Shaw Inc. to reconstruct the baseball, softball, and tennis complex pending a solicitor review. Any questions? Well, this would be a part of the bond issue. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Any plan to get rid of all those geese? You're, or soft, soft, uh, yeah. you're you're approving the bid to yes. award the contract to, award to this company. Yeah. Okay. The bond issue is going to be paying for that. Bid. Okay. Correct. Any yes. plan to get rid of all it the should, yes, case? because from, so we, so here it is, all right, quick story. So back when I was doing maintenance and we started to get the geese there, right? So we went down to PNC Park for a training on how to repair the turf, things like that, talk about the grass and the outfield, all that good stuff. So we asked, like, do you guys get geese down here because you're right here near the river, right? So they said, yeah, we used to. However, it, they got a chemical that you spray on the, on the grass because the geese see wavelengths of the grass, and that's why they land there. So for some reason, our wavelengths are attracting the geese down at Turtle Creek, too. Um, and there's also a food source in there. We think that they're used to coming back to, and they've been nesting there. So now we'd be getting more. So when we change that to turf, that should change the wavelength, and their food will not be abundant for them, and that should take care of the geese. I'm sure our young people will be happy not to be playing in goose water. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yep. 100%. Well, the um, is it uh, the tennis courts 
do they have the ability to be transformed to like pickleball courts or anything along those lines? Or is that a different thing? Just I mean, <laughs> we could always get chalk out and give you some lines, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it's something that we could talk about. I mean, we you figure we haven't gone through final contract and yet there, there could be some type it's of thing. We, just re yeah, we could talk about it, right? Yeah. Big debate that's what about pickleball courts right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. There's Listen, it's a big thing. All American and the Robles getting ready to throw them in up there yeah. too. So, yeah, so, I mean, that's something we could always discuss because the number we have on those for that tennis sports will probably come down anyway, uh, just because we're going to do some value engineering and things like that to make it more cost effective. So, yeah. Anything else? The, with the turf field, mm -hmm. um, so it's not going to create issues um, in the outfield with lines and no. Yeah, when we, yeah. yeah, we should be good. So what we're going to end up doing is there'll be new fencing up there, right? So we're going to take that fencing out that's there that's permanent and we'll have retractable fencing that comes in. So the lines that we will have will be in right field. You might get a corner of it in the infield up there in baseball. It's not going to affect it at all. It won't affect the play or anything like that. Uh, we'll be putting a netting up there to catch any balls that might go out from soccer practice or whatever we got going on or football uses it. Could have like a painted on goalpost. They can they can utilize that as well. We're also putting a crow's nest in back there for Mr. Crone. So now he has a field where the band can go that they're not going uphill in a parking lot, right? So it, it, the field should not interrupt play with baseball. The fencing will be different because we will have a trackable fencing that we can keep the same type of setup we have, so we can play softball and baseball at the same time as well. Thank you. You've obviously put a lot of thought into that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, got a question. Uh, the, um, I, in the um, agenda that I went over last night, there was something uh, about um, community utilizing space, utilizing space in the school district. There was a on the use of facilities request? Yeah, our use yeah. Of, yeah, our facility request. That was 10, that was eleven point one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what that is, we upload every every month who's going to use that, what facility, what where they're at, what type of group they are, what, if we're charging them anything, things like that, for you guys to approve. So. I know someone who is having a problem with doing it online. Kept kicking them out. Just tell them to call me. So we've done that before. If we have issues, I have people call me. And if it's a community group that we have to get their insurance, I'll just say, hey, give me your insurance. I'll upload everything. In. And then when we put it in through the request, I'll make sure if there's fees that have to be charged, things like that, it's in there. I have no problem doing that. And there's an organization that utilizes the facility many times over the years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just have them reach out to me. I have no problem helping anybody out. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Library. Good evening again. Uh, normally, Dr. Coluccio is going to present her own tabs moving forward, uh, but we're wishing her uh, safe and quick healing. She took a fall and actually broke her wrist and ankle, I believe. Uh, so she's not able to be here tonight, and we, we wish her well. She is with us online, uh, but asked me to present her tab. Uh, we seek approval for a new phone system from Full Service Network at the cost of $149.99 per month at a one-time activation and a one-time activation fee of $299.99 with the attached contract. Currently, the Swiss Bay Library runs on the classic landlines and classic landline phones. Um, and we have digital phones in every other building and every classroom all across the district. And uh, they struggle with, with even getting on the internet. So we're hoping to bring them into the 21st century with this tab. Any questions? Okay. I'd also like to name, name that Nate Wilson will be the first member of a pickleball team. So if we have pickleball courts, Nate's gonna be on. Okay, legal matters. Uh, next week, Mr. Rakunas will ask for a motion and a second to accept the settlement agreement as offered. Uh, he would be able to answer questions the board may have about that next Wednesday. School finance. Yes. 
Um, so 15.1 is the resolution that um, has been spoken of several times this evening. So I think everybody understands what that is about. Um, it is what Mr. Muscatello um, and Mr. Mills came to present to you. So we'll be asking for your approval on, on that resolution. 15.2, um, 15.3, 15.4, and 15.5 are our regular bill lists. Our uh, approval for the bill list in September, the reports on the student activities and the funds, and the investment report. That's all. Questions? Questions? Superintendent. On the superintendent's report, I will be asking for a motion and a second to approve two items next week. First, we are seeking approval to name and dedicate the Rankin Community Center after the former Rankin resident. Ms. Dorothy Height uh, in 16.2. I'm asking for a motion a second to approve a marching band trip to the National Memorial Day Parade in DC at a cost of $398 per person. I did speak with Mr. Carr. He is going to attempt to fundraise as much of that to defer the cost. So that would be your top end and whatever fundraising they provide um, would reduce that cost. Any questions on 16.1 or 16.2? I do. The um, concerning the uh, community center, I read a Post Gazette article that talks about the DA being involved with the cameras. That much I knew. Um, the patrol piece I didn't know about. What what does that involve? Patrolling a certain area or, or locking the building? Or... What do you mean? What patrol? Our security patrols? I don't know. In the article, it said the DA is responsible for the cameras and patrols. You'd have to show me that article. Increased, it said increasing patrols in that area. Yeah, he's talking about the policy. He's not talking about, I mean, he wasn't. Then what does that have to do with the center then? You would have to ask the DA that. What? You're in the article talking. There's there's no way you didn't. Is that see a quote it. I so made? You know exactly what you're talking. You know exactly what he's talking about. You read the article. It was posted on the um, I, I'm, social media. Page. I'm really surprised there's all these questions about this Rank Community Center because we've literally been talking about this for six months. This just didn't happen tonight. Now, the right, DA, in the first meeting we had at the Rankin Center, which you are more than welcome to attend these meetings we have, the DA's office came with Allies for Children and offered to put additional cameras and patrols in the Palisades because at the time there was concern over the amount of 911 calls coming out of there. I don't know what other details. Now, I will tell you what I'm focused on is our security patrols that will be there daily. Um, Brian, what do we say? Two to 10 or three to nine? Two to 10. Two to 10. Custodial and security will be there. The question I had had previously concerning the cameras was the DA going to have control of those cameras? Were they the one that's going to be doing the surveillance on, on the other side of the camera? Well, I, uh, as far as the ranking, the ranking building has like we have these folks back there watching us. Correct. The ranking camera or the ranking facility already has cameras, our security cameras. No one has access to them but ours. And there's no one else putting cameras inside or around our ranking elementary school. Again, the patrols. That's what was in the article. And that's I'm looking for clarity on that. That the DA would be responsible for patrols or paying for patrols. Well, I think, I mean, again, I don't know the date of that article, but in the last three months, and I know uh, Miss McDonald, who was the mayor of Rankin, was here when we met with the group Tuesday. Um, I emailed the board right after that meeting. And one of the things she mentioned was they are approving, they have approved the regionalization of the police force. And so now they're going to have an increased police presence in that area in collaboration with North Braddock and Braddock Hills and East Pittsburgh. So I think that we're just going to an old conversation when they didn't have the police coverage for that area. You have any questions? Yeah, I, I just want to make myself clear, too. If I decide to speak during a board meeting and not executive, I can do that. I can speak whenever I want to. 
like the that, people who no elected means, me. By no means am I saying that. I, you're in I send out and 12 emails send, about something and say, please and you don't, don't answer questions. questions just like you're not an, fully answering the questions right now. You, look, look, stop. You're putting on a show. Here's, here's, here's the thing. The, the, the reality is when what what's happening is we're we're speaking we're speaking during board meetings um when when we can easily get answers to questions so the reality is that that any of us who want answers to questions on any agenda items or anything that we're doing can ask those questions the public can also ask questions and what what i found is that our administrative team who has answers to a lot of those questions that we have to uh, to answer gets back to us and can answer those questions effectively what what we're doing here is we're just we're we're holding on to information and then we're just you know we're putting it out here so for example even with the Rankin Center I think that I think that um you know when we're when we're looking at even specific programming my thought on how that's going to go is we we've laid parameters for what the type of programming that we want to see in Rankin it was very clear on our expectations uh, about what we would expect from the people who are going to utilize the center the types of things that they might want to do um, and before they would go and utilize that center, we would make sure that those things were being uh, met. Mr. Ford is going to help ensure that those things are, um, that they're also uh, living up to that. You know, th so then, but then we talk about details that we could ask at, at any other time, and we're bringing it up here and implying that there's, there's no plan for, for the rank and center. There, so there isn't. It, it, well, I, you know, I guess it's it's then a matter of. Then he would be of, able to say. Then he would be able to say how much it costs, exactly what's going to happen there, and it doesn't matter. Just like I said, I've said multiple times, things die behind closed doors if we don't bring them out during a board meeting. That and just like with the public comment thing, you um changing that, you made that decision with a few folks. We get here, we see it, and that's it. So I'll bring it up. Well, it but, doesn't matter if, how people feel about it. I'll bring it up during the board meeting, whatever. I was an elect, I'm an elected official, just like the rest well, of you. Like I said, with 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 the, with the public comment, and I think with the with a lot of things, right? I think that, um, you know, over time, there's we we've had a lot of discussions as a board, as an administrative team, right? And I've 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 come to you know believe that. Um, a lot of a lot of the people that I communicate with on on the board, we have an understanding about um, you know certain rationales, what people are going to um, uh, accept or not. You know, I know that there's a lot of trust that is put into our administrators, who I think even demonstrate tonight that like, they're highly capable. They they've have you know oh, 40 plus years of experience running schools. Um, so uh, oftentimes when it may look like um, there's not a lot of detail going into or it's our $20 million is just a line item, it's not. It's not just a line item. There's a lot of questions that are being asked. There are a lot, there's a lot of um, knowledge that is you know, maintained within the people that are actually putting these things together. And then it's, it is put out here and, um, and it may seem like it's easy, but it's not. Right. And it's just a matter of that's what experience does. And so sometimes when, when you have that experience, sometimes there might be some details that we don't put out there because, you know, it, it's it, it's just we're we're moving and we're getting things done. And, you know, that's that's so. So if there's a detail, which I said, I, that's why I gave you the idea that if you believe that there's something that needs to be communicated in a different way. Right. That, that's something that could easily be put out there. You could it could be emailed to the board and say, you know what, this is missing. Maybe we should put it out there, right? And we would do that, right? I, I think that anybody would be, you know, Ms. Regan's talked about a lot of different things that if there's questions about it, I, I don't doubt that she would clarify it and, and and give it to us if we if we sought it, right? So you know, the idea that you know there's an, any intent in some miscommunications or anything along those lines. You know, I just think it's a matter of style. Maybe it's a matter of what. It's a matter of trust. It's a matter of of anticipating what style. we all believe. Style, protocol, process. Um, I always have to go back to those those contracts. There should have been board discussion before it got on the agenda as to the contents of those. So when you talk about communication and style. And only that. 
Here's the since thing. you just mentioned the twenty million dollars, um, you know, taking out that bond. It says here, <clears throat> and actually, I have received calls from parents before I even saw. The, I didn't even know that that was on the um, agenda about taking this out. So, and it says for capital projects previously approved, there shouldn't have been a discussion it was about that. A June. discussion about that with it with twenty million dollars. That that line it should have looked just like this okay. for capital product. Um, projects it should have looked just like that and it didn't so you're, you're once again that's a that's a suggestion you're saying is that it should it should look like that it, you know we it, should it, be it, informed I, I before we get here before we vote before it pops up on the agenda and just like i said i usually do not agree with most of what mr belmont says and how he votes but yeah, the committee meetings, and, and, and the thing is, even if we have committee meetings, we're still going to have things popping up on the agenda, um, just randomly popping up. That's not okay. Did the ranking center randomly pop it up? It doesn't matter. Why do, why oh, yeah. do you, you still, why do you still not have? Why every week do these meetings end like this? This is uh, like a silly sideshow. You guys have to do better at communicating in a forum where you can be professional and you guys can be confidential. These type of behaviors and this type of tone is not for public. This is not a tone of public speaking. This is not a mannerism of public speakers, let alone a board. Let's get better. Let's please move forward, please. At least tonight, please. Not tonight, not any night. Well, you don't, you don't run me. If well, I don't I'm not trying to, because if I did, you wouldn't act like that. And stop, stop with me, Darnika. I'm not. I am not opposing anything you're saying. I'm not opposing what you're saying. I'm not opposing what you're saying. I'm opposing the time and place. I just don't think everything is for everyone. I'm not opposing you, and I'm not going back and forth with you. It's way beneath my pay grade. So I just think that there is a time and a place for us to discuss our matters. We're adults. Yeah. Every week, it's like pure D sideshow entertainment for no reason. We can have these discussions in another forum. That's yeah. all. Here. here, please, please. It'll be here. We're, we're gonna. We're going to. We're going to move on um, you know, with the superintendent, please, and then we can address it. I'm my my part is finished. Okay. Thank you. Um, old business. I was voted on. Okay. Okay. New business. I'll discuss new business. Oh, no, you got something? Go ahead. I, I'd like to bring up committee meetings. Can we uh, discuss bringing those back? I think that's worth discussing. And I think I said that before. You know, this, <laughs> you know, I do think we should try to go back to committee meetings. So, so maybe that's something we could talk about next week. So we'll committee, um, what I'd like to hear about is what form we believe committee meetings should be in. If, what should they, what should they say? Well, well, you, you've had experience with this, uh, but I know that the public is interested in us having committee meetings and it might solve some problems they have about transparency. How were they handled in the past, Mr. Belmont? We had uh, two nights uh, last week of the month, start at five o'clock, and you had half meetings on one night, half meetings on the other. Each department head ran their agenda. Then the superintendent would move on to the next agenda from the next department. And it would be, the committee would discuss the item. Then the uh, rest of the board that was in attendance could have their input. And then the public who was here or on Zoom, we invited their input and there was always a good back and forth getting input from the uh, residents who uh, several had uh, sincere interest in a lot of what we were discussing. So, um, and then at the end of the public meetings, agenda and legislative public comment, if there was something brought up, then the board president will look at Ms. Sartrell and say, you know, that last topic is your committee stick it on your agenda. So then you continue the discussion that way. So that's how it works. And as I reviewed from the P 
PSBA, the public doesn't actually have to be given permission to speak at committee meetings, but we have let them. Yes. It's pretty cool. Um, I so basically, so the way the committee meetings ran was Mr. Wilson would take his board tabs, he has tonight, mm -hmm. and the Wednesday before, he would have a curriculum committee meeting, and then he would talk. And then he would come to the agenda setting meeting, and he'd read through his curriculum, and this is basically their individual reports. That's... Um... They weren't well attended. I got to be honest, they they weren't. But but they would they would be attended by the members of the board because we are actually all on committees, mm -hmm. right? I felt way more informed when we did it that way than the way we've been doing it the last twelve months. I'll put that out there. And keep in mind what Doctor Costanza just just uh, descriptive. Since he's been here, that's how it's been. What uh, Mr. Belmont has expressed was pre Doctor. So what what committee meetings what so my observation of committee meetings um, were were what what was articulated our administrators would come it was and it was the first week of the month if I if I if I recall so in the first week of the month we we had we asked our administrators to come in and speak to what it is that they would be putting on the agenda right now often often the the our administrators would be scrambling to find what figure out what they're going to put on the agenda because sometimes there are items that that might not make the the cut they're, they're, they have internal discussions about what it is that they might want to do right sure. right so so what we're doing now is then we we're we're kind of making our administrators come up with items to come and speak to us about now now so so that's how it was. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to that. So what we would get is we would often have conversations about things that a, we cannot, we cannot, um, there's intricacies in terms of what we can speak about and not. So some of the things that are brought up, we can't actually go be candid and we can't speak about publicly. So we're kind of giving half information. So now we're talking about conversations about some of these items that we can't really go in depth on because it would it would take talking about individuals it could, it could be talking about personnel it could be talking about students anything along those lines right which is what i observed when going to committee meetings often was it, they would often devolve into uh conversations where it was where we were saying where the administration was saying things that well you know we can't really talk about that or we can't go in depth on that which then led to conversations amongst the public that were ill-informed. Now, 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 I'm not um, averse to the idea that, and then, then when you add in the component of of uh, public comment to that, right? We simply invited often um, um, opportunities for the public to jump up and down on administrators for 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 issues. I I I witnessed it many times. So this is the, this is my opinion of it, right? And this is what informs my perspective of it, right? So it my my thing is when we keep talking about committee meetings, we're talking about that structure. We're talking about going back to that where we're requiring two extra days a month that our administrators come in in the evening and talk about the same things that were that were being that are being talked about today. Okay? We're do we're also inviting conversation on things that we can't actually talk about um, publicly, right? So if we wanted to have committee meetings, but narrow the scope, which is why I asked what form would we want them to take, uh, I'm, I'm all for that. But it, it, it would have generated this list that we're looking at right now, right? Potenti which is a pretty spiffy list, the things to do in my mind. Uh, but but what's it going to hurt us to try it? We, 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 we can adopt strong senses of decorum because all we're adults we can we can control ourselves i think we should i think we should do that i think we should have at committee meetings and as adults teach ourselves to be the best we can be and and uh, and because i think there's a, a number i think you might have a majority of people here that feel that we would like to have I don't know if we need a motion to that. I think I think it's something that we can just decide to, to decide to do. I think we I, I think um, in terms of I'm just bringing it up publicly that that I'm, you know I'm I'm fully 
I'm putting out there what I what I believe is that it's it there there it's any it creates inefficiency. I think it creates um, it creates um, um, unnecessary uh, uh, issues because we can't be fully transparent about certain things. Well, uh, I, I, so I just be, we have we we can take that, but I think we need to try to be our best. I don't, I don't. I, and, and people say, what, your school board doesn't have committee meetings. And I say, I know we're, we're out of the norm in that respect. And it might not, it know. might not, it might not produce that much, but the public will be happy to have had a chance to have a say. Maybe they can invite them rather than speaking to email their questions in that way. We won't feel like they're, we're going to get beat up, or, you know, uh, invite the public to uh, live time, email into us if they have a question. Uh, or, but I think that uh, we need to have committee meetings. Do we need a motion to that? A I motion, move, yeah. I, I move that we in, uh, we in, reinstitute committee meetings starting with the first uh, week of October. Second. I, I would just tell you, you can, you can certainly do that. I would just tell you that I don't think you can amend this agenda right now. That's a work session agenda. Oh, it is? Yeah. I mean, okay. it's been, I mean, I'll move it again and, next and week. I can't move it, but I'm between five. But you can make the motion, and I can add it next week. I will move business. it next. Um, I'll move it next week. I mean, no, but we could, yes. you can move it now, and I'll put it on next week. It'll be on okay. the agenda. It'll be posted Friday. I'm excited. I want to be on the agenda. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Also, for, oh, no. Did you have something to say? Oh, uh, for new business also. So I know that Mr. And this is, goes back to what's done in executive and said in executive and how things are being handled. I know that um, Mr. Clanigan during a board meeting a couple of months ago said something about this while the solicitor is here. So I know I'm gonna have to mention this next week as well about how we have board members who do not live in this district and who have been serving on this board. One for a year, uh, one coming up on a year. And so that is also how some of these, in, in my opinion, problematic uh, things are being passed. Um, and so one, um, that's also been called out on social media and a couple of different um, forums by elected officials, parents, um, and even I spoke with uh, people about it. And each time they said that we have to go to our solicitor about it. Mr. Clanigan's already done that. Um, and yeah, so that's that's a problem. So that we need to solve. You know exactly which board members it is because we you've already admitted that they don't live in the district. I wait, wait. Well, first of all, I have no idea what you're talking about, actually. Okay. But 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 if if we're going back to there's there's a there's a way to go about. This discussion. So we either either it's a either it's a factor. It is either somebody is is able to serve on the the, the board or they're not. So you know, like we this is not the the forum to even litigate something like this. And in, in as far as I'm concerned, we're kind of we're bringing up uh, things that we can't actually uh, uh, talk about. We can't actually. There's nothing that we're going to they're do not here personnel. to to do. Yeah, but there's nothing. You're you're kind of making an assertion. So either it's a Either we have we support that and we we go through the proper channels to deal with it, or we're talking about individuals that um and it's being they touched. I, don't believe I mean, I expect them that. to be here next week. We can discuss it again while Mr. Uh, Rick Lunas is here. But that's what I was told that we have to discuss that and make some sort of change with the solicitor. What's that? What's the change? What do we have to do? What do we have to do? Discuss it with the solicitor, but it has already okay. been discussed with the solicitor. And then what's and the next he's step? he's supposed to give us options for that, but no. uh, Mr. Clanigan's already um, discussed that, and that has not, there hasn't been any sort of change. So that's an issue. So what's the next step? Right. That's Because so other, it's not we, like it was We need to ask the, the solicitor would be the one who would, who would in, inform us on that? I've, I've not okay. had the conversation. He's, he's brought this up during a board meeting before. So why don't we do this, Mr. Scott? Why don't you talk to Mr. Racunas, um, get okay. his advisement? What I mean, all of you, all of anybody who has a question about where residency and whether somebody is legally allowed to be on the board or not, after can, they move can that ask, to district, ask the solicitor what the process is for dealing with that and then proceed accordingly. What I'm saying is right now we're talking about something that there is a there is a process for. 
<laughs> work the process and 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 then then we'll deal with it but we should not be talking about individuals where it's you're we're speculating on um yes, where they like live it. and whether they're legally allowed to be there if you, if you if you believe that somebody is not supposed to be on the board work the process get it and and do what you need to do that's it so we we don't need to discuss this any further and i don't well, like well, talking about people that, Mr. Clinton, that, again if you do you remember what was that when you asked about from who? When you asked Mr. Rakunas about it and you brought it up during the board meeting. You know, I need more clarity. I, you know, I didn't get no distinct law, ordinance, or policy. So it, does, it doesn't, but, but since Mr. Rakunas is not here, everything that's being said right now is simply hearsay anyway. Once again, so next week, Feel free to have the conversation with Mr. Rakunas in the room. He can answer the he can answer the questions yeah, that you might have, the and, board, you, and board, you can maybe. proceed with that. So this is what I'm saying. We're not talking about this uh, any further. Is there any other new business? Yeah. Okay. Um, no. What, what? Just just read the board policy upon board members, please. That's all. That's all I ask. Do I have a motion and a second to adjourn? So moved. Second.